Welcome to our talk on specification-driven verification. Before we begin, let me briefly tell you about us. Ken Kundert and I, Henry Chang, founded Designer's Guide in 2005. Since our founding, we've been assisting semiconductor companies with analog, mixed signal, and chip verification. We started with consulting, then as we gained insight into the issues and problems and solutions, we began teaching classes. It was then, after seeing many projects and talking to many people, that we realized where the true bottleneck is for analog and mixed signal verification. We then developed a software tool that removes this bottleneck and makes it so that one doesn't have to be an expert to have good models and to verify that one's models and schematics are equivalent. We call this tool MIM, which stands for Models in Minutes. MIM does a lot more though, and that's what we'll be discussing throughout this YouTube channel. We also provide onshore and offshore analog, mixed signal, chip level modeling and verification services. Ken was a fellow at Cadence prior to founding Designer's Guide. He invented the Spectre Simulator, leading its development and leading the related efforts of creating the Verilog A and Verilog AMS languages, as well as developing Cadence's AMS Designer Mixed Signal Simulator. Prior to that, Ken had received his PhD in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from UC Berkeley and had been an analog and microwave designer working at HP and Tektronix. I was an architect at Cadence prior to founding Designer's Guide. I worked in R&D, advanced R&D, methodology services, and corporate strategy, where I worked on analog and mixed signal design flows, focused on improving the efficiency of design and verification. Prior to Cadence, I received my PhD from UC Berkeley, where my research was focused on a top-down, constraint-driven design methodology for analog integrated circuits. Ken and I have authored many patents, journal articles, research papers, and books. Analog verification breaks into these three basic steps. First, we're going to partition the design into top-level schematics and modeled blocks. Essentially, we're working out where the modeling boundaries are and we're figuring out what blocks need to be modeled. Second, we're going to create and validate block models. It is essential that we validate that the block models match the schematics because the models aren't being fabricated, the schematics are. If the model works but the schematics don't, we could miss a bug. But just as problematic, if the model is wrong but the schematic is right, a bug could be introduced in the RTL where no bug existed before. In order to compare models and schematics, we're going to write self-checking test benches that give pass-fail results as to whether or not the model and schematics are functionally equivalent. Finally, we're going to combine the models with the top-level schematics and verify the composite system. Here, we're going to write a test bench to perform that verification of the top level. These models and test benches can be in either Verilog AMS or System Verilog. To give you an idea of the resource expenditure, we make the following estimate. A typical project has 20 to 50 blocks that need to be modeled. A typical block requires 1 to 10 days of effort to write that model in the test bench. The reason it takes this long is that a typical model has 100 to 400 lines of code. A typical test bench has 200 to 800 lines of code. Add that all up, a typical project requires two to nine person months just for the block level modeling and validation. You can't do step three, the system level verification, until the previous step of writing all the models is done. The system level verification is the most intellectually interesting and fruitful step. This is where we actually use all the models. Our experience has been, while 50% of the bugs we find are in the schematics, such as swap bits, bad decode logic, or a missing switch in power down mode, Finding these bugs happen during the model verification step. The other half of the bugs are in the RTO and they aren't found typically until a full chip simulation is run with all of the models. This is why step three is so critical and mostly why people write block level models. When it comes to analog verification, a commitment is required. And the commitment is to write all these block level models because the benefit doesn't happen until you have all of them. To show you how we get that estimate, of the two to nine person months, this is how it breaks down. So suppose person months is equal to the number of blocks times the days per block divided by the days per month. So say you have 50 blocks and it takes three days per block. That ends up to be about 7.5 person months. You have 50 blocks and five days per block and you have 12.5 person months. I typically estimate about four days per block. One day to write the model, one day to write the test bench, one day to run that test bench against the schematic, and then one day throughout the project to update the model, rerun the test bench as the schematics get updated. The model review and validation costs can be substantial. 
Most designers cannot effectively review a Verilog AMS model or a system Verilog model. Many companies require designers to validate the model. Most designers cannot write a Verilog AMS or system Verilog test bench. The biggest complaint about analog verification is the time and the cost of creating block level models. It is a repetitive process and so benefits greatly from a productive workflow. This is the idea behind specification driven verification. We automate the creation of the model and test bench and we automate the validation of the model. This is how we make analog verification practical. In specification driven verification, we start with the spec. The spec contains all necessary information to build the model and to verify that the circuit and the model are equivalent. Functional specs for analog blocks are generally pretty simple. The complexity naturally flees to digital. Analog typically doesn't contain state, nor does it contain a lot of logic. The functional specs can be easily created by the analog designer. We then formalize the spec to make it machine readable, and that allows for the automatic generation of the model and the test bench. Our flow is that we take a formalized specification, an executable spec, and turn it into a model, a test bench, and verification scripts automatically. It's a practical way of efficiently producing validated models. An example of spec is shown here for programmable gain amplifier. This block has seven different ports, an output voltage, an input voltage, a 6-bit word for gain, an enable pin, a bias pin, a supply pin, and a ground pin. The behavior can be easily described as doing a dB to voltage gain conversion and then taking that gain, multiplying it by the input and the enable to get the voltage output. In addition, we can model the supply current and we can add range limits for the other inputs, the bias, supply, and ground, which will ultimately turn into assertions. Our tool for doing this is called Models in Minutes or MIM. It takes a formalized spec turns into a model, test bench, and creates verification scripts. It's easily accessible at the URL below, mim.designersguide.com. There are several key benefits to having executable specifications. First, you have up-to-date specs that always exist and are unambiguous. The model is always consistent with the spec because the test bench assures that the circuit matches the spec also. Today, designers often have specifications, but they're usually incomplete and they're out of date. And because people know they're incomplete and out of date, no one reads them. And because no one reads them, the designer typically doesn't bother updating them. We end up in a chicken or egg situation. By having an executable spec, we break that chicken or egg cycle and we can have up-to-date specs. Human readable specifications facilitate communication. It's much easier to read than any kind of model, whether it's Verilog, System Verilog, or Verilog AMS. And these specs are extremely helpful when doing verification reviews. Designers easily understand what is being modeled and other verification engineers also. Finally, it allows designers to contribute to the verification process. They can do a quick sanity check of the model and they can create the first version of the specification. There are some things they need to know when they're writing the specifications, but they can easily write a first version and have someone clean it up. This is specification driven analog verification. The spec is easy to understand, much easier than models, it's easy to review and easy to update. When the models are generated, there is consistent use of best modeling practices. In addition, as we develop better modeling practices, the models can be regenerated without touching any of the input to implement those new better modeling practices. This results in uniform models that are easily shareable. One of the hardest steps in chip level verification is when you combine all the models together for the first time. There's always going to be debugging required. When the models are not uniform, it is very difficult for the chip level verification person because they have to examine each model to figure out what's going on. And if they're all different, they have to first figure out the conventions that were used in each particular model and then figure out what's going on. In our situation, all the models follow the same convention, so it's much easier to figure out what's going on. In addition, they can just go back and look at the specifications without looking at the details of the model to understand what the models are doing. We generate self-checking test benches. These are comprehensive test benches that check everything. By doing the model versus schematic comparison, we're not only verifying the model, but we're also functionally verifying the schematic. Imagine that you have the programmable gain amplifier that I showed before. 
the gain will go up uniformly as the gain goes up. Imagine the schematic that the least two significant bits are flipped. As you compare the model and the schematic, it will detect the fact that the model and the schematic are not equivalent because in one case the gain is monotonically increasing, but in the schematic it's not. So by running this test bench, you'll find that bug in the schematic. There are often things that are often neglected that can surprise you in the schematic. For example, sometimes people forget to test when the enable is off. Do they check that the supply current in all the bias sources really do turn off when the block is off? We generate the verification scripts. This way we verify and manage all the blocks in mass, and we provide productivity to support hundreds of blocks. We believe that analog verification greatly benefits from analog verification engineers. The approach of analog verification in general is a non-traditional approach. It's largely command line, text file based rather than GUI schematic based. It can be very efficient, but can be uncomfortable for traditional analog designers that are not used to that environment. It benefits from analog verification engineers that are proficient in writing code and also understanding analog circuits. So while a traditional designer might be very good at designing analog circuits, they may not be as proficient in writing code. Not all companies have analog verification engineers. Oftentimes, companies will employ external analog verification engineers who are unfamiliar with your circuits. Essentially, using the tool without entering a spec for the block behavior, we can have the tool just generate the test bench. The test bench can go through all the basic sequences of the block simulated on the schematic, and so you can see what's going on using a waveform viewer. So now, even though the model and the test benches are being generated outside of your group, the specifications allow the designers to review those models without the need to read the models and without the need to duplicate any simulations. In this case, specification-driven verification makes outsourcing of the model creation and block-level verification practical. The partitioning and system level verification should still be done in house because that requires detailed knowledge of the circuit and the end application. Of course, the entire verification could be outsourced, in which case all three steps would be taken care of by the external team. By using specification driven verification, there are huge productivity gains for block level verification. For example, we worked on a bias block that had 30 outputs. We were able to model and validate that in 45 minutes meaning we created the model, we created the test bench, and ran the test bench against the schematic to make sure that the model was correct, all in 45 minutes. Going with this approach has substantially less designer involvement, has easy models for review, there's a consistent style for all the models and test benches, and you can outsource model development and validation. If you click on the link in the upper left, you'll be able to see our next video, which will be an example of how we create a specification. If you click on the link in the lower left, you'll get the playlist for all of the videos in this series where we talk about specification-driven verification. And if you click on the right, you can subscribe to our channel. Thank you for your interest in specification-driven verification.